chapter 15, lesson 5. This will be the last lesson of chapter 15, and in this chapter we've been talking about equilibrium, and we've done some calculations using the equilibrium constant, and here we'll talk about some qualitative effects, um, and this technically will be shifting equilibrium, whether to the products or to the reactant side. And this is given to us, famously, by what's called Le Chatelier's principle. Le Chatelier was a French chemist, and uh, his principle states as follows, and I'll read this in French. If a system at equilibrium is disturbed by a change in the temperature, pressure, or the concentration of one of the components of the system will shift its equilibrium position so as to counteract the effect of the disturbance. So, in essence, what this is saying is that if you put some sort of pressure on the equilibrium system, it will try to undo what you put on it. So it'll do the opposite of what you try to do to the system. And we'll take a look at these. Um, there are a lot of stresses we can put on the system, and the system will shift to counteract that, to undo that. So we will take a look at these four stresses, or these four ways we can affect the system. We'll take a look at um, changing the concentration of our reactants and products, um, adjusting volume and pressure. This will especially apply to gases, and then adjusting the temperature. And here we'll have to think about whether the reaction is exo or endothermic. And finally, adding a catalyst, which famously uh, is involved with many chemical reactions. And we'll take a look at these in step. So um, we're going to use for our example the famous Haber process. And this is um, an, a very famous equilibrium equation uh, for the production of ammonia, this substance here, uh, an extremely important chemical uh, industrially, especially uh, its use in, uh, in uh, agriculture as a fertilizer, extremely important, as well as um, other uh, related industries. So. What this says is that if we decide to add H2 to the system, the system will try, try to undo the added H2. So if I increase H2, then the system will try to remove H2, and the only way you can do that is by producing more products, by shifting the equilibrium to the right. Now, yeah, so here it says, as it shifts it to the right, H2 and N2 being reactants, will decrease, and NH3 being a product will increase. So if we put the stress on the system with this red arrow, the system will try to reduce the stress with this blue, blue arrow by shifting it to the right. So technically it undoes the pressure that's been placed on it. And we'll take a look at um, a few of these examples. Um, and the new equilibrium that's established will have essentially a um, a different ratio of reactants and products, which means we've shifted the equilibrium to the products. So this graphically shows uh, we've increased H2, um, and then what happens is H2 must, the system must decrease our, our uh, stress. It must undo our stress. That's why H2 decreases. Here, NH3 increases and N2 decreases. Now the ratio of all three of these here gave you the constant, we'll say Kp in our case, and the Kp constant is still the same. Kp never changed in this case. Uh, it's just the ratios of the reactants and products changed, but the ratio, or, or the ratio stayed the same, the amounts have changed, but the ratio stayed the same, is the idea. So, here's the general rule. Adding a reactant or product shifts the equilibrium away from the increase. Removing a reactant or product shifts it towards the decrease. And we'll see this in, in an example here in a minute. So the effect of volume uh, is directly related to the effect of pressure. And again, this will apply more to gases. Uh, but from Boyle's law, we recall that as volume is decreased, pressure is increased. So we, if you recall, said that volume and pressure are inversely related. This is the only inverse relationship in uh, the, for the gas laws. And uh, if pressure then is increased, based on Le Chatelier's principle, the system will shift to counteract that increase. It will try to decrease the pressure. And in order to decrease the pressure, the way it decreases the pressure 
is it removes gases. Uh, so it shifts to the side that has less gas. Um, so really the same principle. If you increase the pressure, the system tries to decrease the pressure. Now notice that we can increase um, the pressure by decreasing the volume. So volume, recall, has uh, an effect on the pressure. So we can indirectly increase the pressure by decreasing the volume. So this is an example here. Um, if you have this equilibrium and you decide to increase the pressure, and notice that we have two moles of gas on the product side and only one mole of gas on the reactant side. So there is more pressure, you can say, on the product side, being that there's more gas particles. So if you decide to increase the pressure, the system will, if you increase the pressure, technically it's like uh, you're increasing how much you, you have on the right side um, and the system shifts to the left to reduce that pressure. That's how it knows to reduce the pressure is by forming less moles of gas. So here it says the instant the pressure increases, the system uh, reduces the number of moles of gas and react, the reaction is, uh, the reverse reaction is favored, which means we're shifting to the left. And again, um, the new equilibrium will still have the same constant, uh, but now the amounts are different, though the ratio of the two remains the same. And then uh, the third change is temperature. And here, uh, temperature affects the equilibrium constant. So the other changes do not affect the equilibrium constant as much as temperature does, because usually constants are temperature dependent. That's why you always see, if you're given a constant, it says at you know, 300 cal uh, degrees Celsius or something, it gives you a temperature. That's because temperature affects the constants. Constants are temperature dependent. So here, in order to predict the effect that temperature will have, we'll have to consider whether the reaction is endothermic or whether it's exothermic. Recall that if delta H, the change in heat, is positive or above zero, we call this an endothermic change. If it's negative, below zero, that means heat is released. So the way to help um, visualize the effect that temperature will have on equilibrium systems is to think of temperature as um, a product or, or a reactant. So think of, anytime we increase the temperature, think of adding heat to the reaction. Um, and then to reestablish that equilibrium, the system will shift in the direction that removes the heat. And we'll show you an example of this here. So here it says adding heat uh, favors away from the increase. So if our system is endothermic, uh, think of this as, uh, so we have a reactant in equilibrium with a product. If we are endothermic, that means our heat can be thought of as a reactant. Because endothermic means heat must be put into the system. So if an, for an endothermic system, if you increase heat, this is like adding reactant. The system will shift to the right to remove it, shift toward the products. Uh, and then if our system is exothermic, like in the second case, then we have reactants and products, and we can think of heat as a product. And so if you increase the heat in this instance, then the system will remove the heat by shifting the reaction to the left. So that's how to really think of heat as either endothermic, that means it's a reactant, or exothermic, meaning it's a product. And then the same exact thing can be thought of if you remove heat. So again, if our uh, system is endothermic, we have reactants in equilibrium with products. If it's endothermic, heat is a reactant. And if you remove heat, then the system must reestablish that equilibrium. It'll move to increase that heat. And then likewise for exothermic, since heat is now a product, if you remove heat, it's like removing a product, the system shifts to the right to replenish that heat. So always think about the uh, principle in terms of undoing what the stress did. And uh, we'll use this example uh, as a means of uh, describing uh, or as a means of review uh, for in our case. So here it says we have a reaction and we're given the delta H to be less than zero. So recall that this means it is exothermic because the change in energy is negative, energy was released. 
So how will the, sh uh, will the equilibrium be affected in the following increases? So if we take a look at uh, part A, oxygen gas is added. So if we add oxygen gas, this is like increasing the amount of reactant that we have. The system undoes it by shifting it to the right, so it can decrease how much oxygen we've put in it. So in this case, oxygen added shifts it to the right. to re-establish the equilibrium. When we heat the reaction in part B, let's use a different color here, uh, when reaction is heated, uh, because our system is exothermic, we can think of heat as a product. So when we heat the reaction, we're effectively increasing how much product, how much heat product we have, so the system shifts to the left to remove that heat product. So in this case, the shift would be left. Uh, next would be volume. Here it says that the volume of the reaction vessel is doubled. So why don't we use a fine color like uh, orange. If um, we double the volume, remember that if volume increases, pressure must decrease. So we effectively decrease the pressure uh, on the system. So if the pressure is decreased, the system will try to increase the pressure. And the question is, which way will the system go to increase the pressure? Well, we'll take a look at the gas moles. On the product side, we have two moles of gas. On the reactant side, we have three moles of gas. So if the system wants to increase the pressure, it'll go to the side with more gas, because the more gas you have, the higher the pressure. So the system will shift to the left to increase the pressure, since we've decreased the pressure. So this will be shifts left. You can say because it must increase in pressure due to the decrease that uh, we've put on the system. Uh, and then part D, we we'll use this color here, in part D, a quantity of noble gas is added. Now, the noble gas um, idea is it will not react, it will not interact with any of the substances here, so effectively it will increase the pressure. If you uh, add a quantity of noble gas, you're increasing the pressure. And if you increase the pressure, the system will try to decrease that pressure. And in this case, we just talked about we have less pressure on the right side, so the system will shift right to decrease that pressure. So it'll be shifts right. Because if you add um, another gas to the system, you're effectively increasing the pressure of the system. You have to be careful because sometimes uh, a substance that's added may participate in a reaction and therefore remove a reactant. There we would shift uh, accordingly, and, but we don't have that example here. And finally a catalyst is added, and this is the easiest of them all, even though we haven't really talked about it, but a catalyst will not shift the system uh, anywhere because a catalyst simply speeds up the reaction, so we say no change here. So catalyst simply um, speeds up how fast we get to equilibrium, it, but it does not uh, change the direction of uh, the shift of the, in equilibrium. So no change in this case. You can say catalyst only affects rate. Even though catalysts are extremely important, they will not shift equilibrium. So hopefully this is a good overview of Le Chatelier's principle, and this is really the uh, heart of this lesson. We're going to finish up, um, and here is a quick discussion of catalyst. So here it says, uh, because we have an equilibrium, we can think about a reaction coordinate diagram. We've seen this before. We can think about this as going forward and backward. So we can think of this as an equilibrium system. And um, a catalyst, recall, lowers the activation energy. This is the energy of activation. So it allows the reaction to get to equilibrium faster, but um, the composition, equilibrium composition, remains un unaltered, which means we don't change how much product or reactant we have at equilibrium. And we're going to finish our discussion with uh, the famous Haber process. Um, again, th this is we're going to show you how this um, Le Chatelier's principle is applied to a real-life industrial situation. The synthesis of ammonia. Um, 
was known for a long while uh, from the gases nitrogen and hydrogen. Now, both of these are very easily obtained. The nitrogen, in fact, is part of the air. About 78% of the air that we breathe is nitrogen. Hydrogen can easily be obtained from the hydrolysis of water, the breaking down of water. So hydrogen is extremely available. However, if you put these two together, uh, the equilibrium constant that you get for this reaction <clears throat> is very, very small. Uh, well, sh we should say very much, much smaller than one. We should say very, very small. Which means, if you recall, our equilibrium constant is products over reactants, which means at equilibrium we have a lot of reactants and a little bit of products. But we want our product, we want NH3, we want to form this compound, which is industrially extremely important. The wealth of a nation depends in large part on how much NH3 it has. So um, we can think about how we can maximize the production of NH3, how we can engineer our uh, factory or our production system to maximize the production of this product. And let's think about um, how this would happen. And here is the setup. <clears throat> Let me put the reaction up here in the corner again. So we had nitrogen plus hydrogen in equilibrium with ammonia. And again, uh, the balanced equation would show a 3 here. Now notice what we do. Here um, is a setup. <clears throat> the reaction uh, is actually carried out in this chamber. And then uh, you can say the reactants and then the products are in this chamber. Here's our ammonia. Here's where it comes out. So we let in our reactants through, uh, we'll say, uh, an external valve or something, and uh, we pump it into um, a chamber where we have a catalyst, and catalysts, again, are usually used to increase the temperature. This catalyst runs at a high temp um, in order to speed up the reaction. And there are some heating coils, and as the reactants combine together, they are compressed. As they go this way, here it says um, they're pumped and compressed. Now, if you think about the uh, first instance here, we're adding, uh, increasing the amount of N2 and H2. So as we increase the reactant side, the sh system shifts to the right to produce more product. That's a good change. Now, as we're compressing it and compressing the gases, we're also increasing the amount of gas or, or you can say the increasing the amount of pressure. So the system, again, has to undo that by shifting it to the right. And furthermore, as uh, the product is uh, finally pumped this way, um, NH3 is released. So now we're removing the amount of NH3 in the system, and this is automatically set up to remove NH3. That furthermore shifts it to the right. So notice all of these changes actually promote the production of NH3. Uh, and that is what um, is, is signified here. So understanding how you can shift equilibrium is extremely important in being able to produce these substances. This is kind of a complicated system, uh, but uh, an, a chemical engineer would have to come up with something, or, a, or, a struct, or, or an engineer for a, a factory of this sort would have to think about these, uh, these concepts. So that should conclude for us Lesson 5 of Chapter 15.